Before we get started, my name's Rebecca from My Special Child. I have a bit of a delay from Beck, but we'll see how we go. Can everyone hear me okay? So hi everyone, my name's Robin and thanks to Beck for having me from My Special Child. I'm from the Neuro Rehab Network. You'll see my website everywhere, so please come and check me out. I'm a developmental educator and an exercise physiologist. I work in the mainstream schools at the moment, um, but I have worked in special needs schools and in family homes as well. So I set up therapy programs for kids who have anxiety. So I wanted to run you through what anxiety is, why it affects our behaviour, um, why we might do uh, strange and random things, why we might have tantrums. So you'll learn all about that tonight. Um, please, as Beck said, ask any questions that you need in the chat section. Um, Beck will help remind me to answer those questions. So what is anxiety? Sorry, I will explain. I do fidget a lot. So if you see random fidget toys coming out, that's to keep myself at bay. So I'll try and hide them. <laughs> I keep seeing them pop up. So um, really briefly, I want to give you heaps of time for question and answers at the end. Um, I look at anxiety in um, a bear. A bear is an example that I use every time I explain anxiety. Anxiety is that feeling of increased heart rate. Our pupils dilate. We get really sweaty. And we would do this, we're designed to do this if we're in a forest and there's a bear. Our anxiety is designed that if we see a bear, we then go into fight or flight mode. We then want to fight the bear and protect ourselves or preferably we want to run away from the bear. To do that, we need our pupils to be dilated. We need our heart rate to be ready to go. But the problem with anxiety is this could be happening while we're at school. This could be happening where there's no bear, there's no forest. We're just eating our breakfast in the morning. That's where we start to look at anxiety. So um, any time that I explain to kids what anxiety is, I like to explain that you know our body gets really overexcited and we feel really yucky inside. It's because our body's worrying about something that's not there, but our body doesn't know that it's not real. Our body will believe it. So any kid who is anxious about something, their brain is going through real feelings and real responses. They're not making it up. You can see the difference between an anxious meltdown and a tantrum. I can chat to you a bit about that later. But if you think about bear, forest, Anxiety is when we're doing all of those responses, but we're in a typical day. So what anxiety typically looks like, and everyone's different, we get easily frustrated. They can say that they have tummy aches. So I always have any student or any kid that comes up to me and says, my tummy's really sore. I believe them. I try and walk them through it. I want to know whether they've had anything to eat, whether they've had enough water. Um, I want to know what they've eaten, I go through that first and then I start to look at what they might be nervous about. Kids unfortunately can't express anxiety, they can't come out and tell us I have anxiety but they can tell us my tummy's churning, I have a headache and those signs help us to know what's going on. You might find these kids frequently go to the bathroom, not necessarily to go to the bathroom, it could be a way of escaping whatever's making them anxious. So I deal with a lot of kids that escape the class to go to the bathroom a lot. Shortness of breath is another one. So you'll see them wheezing and breathing really shallow and that can be worse when they're feeling anxious. Um, I look at them also, they might cry all of a sudden, they might have trouble in regulating their emotions and that's because that body is in fight or flight mode. That body's so far on alert that it's about to crack. Um, so trying to calm them down. I also have a lot of kids who have troubles with making mistakes. So, you know, for me, I'd be given a worksheet and I'd want to sit down and do my worksheet. Um, but for these kids, that worksheet set off their anxiety because they want perfection. They can't prepare themselves to go outside the line. Or what if I go to form my name on paper and I make a mistake? And that is enough to set off a meltdown. We would have it too, for example, I want my house to be spotless and if I can't make it spotless, then I'm shutting down, I'm overwhelmed. Um, so we all do it, it's just different for everyone. I like everyone to know that anxiety isn't always bad. <laughs> anxiety is a good thing. We need anxiety. Anxiety helps us to get to work on time because we're worried about being late. Anxiety helps us to go to the doctor because we're concerned about our health. Anxiety goes in this beautiful bell-shaped curve, which you can see. So if we don't have enough anxiety, we stay in bed all day and we don't care about getting to work on time. If we have too much anxiety, then we're so overwhelmed that we shut down or we start to fight in yelling, screaming, hitting, throwing. So it's that optimal level right at the top of that graph that we want to be at. And ways that we can get there is to either increase our arousal level, so get us a little bit more motivated, 
or we can calm down our anxiety. And that's the pocket that we always try and get into. And that pocket is different for so many different kids. So for me, I fidget a lot. I constantly have a fidget toy. I take fidget toys to my meetings, to training sessions, to therapy sessions. And that gets me into my optimal level of anxiety. Fidgeting with it calms me down enough, so drops my anxiety down enough. It also motivates me enough. So as soon as I have something in my hands, I'm ready to focus. And that's when I can get to that optimal. Some people, it might be a cup of coffee. They'll find that a cup of coffee with the smell and the heat around their hands, that will get them to optimal. Every person has an optimal level of anxiety and it's tapping into what gets you there and knowing when to use that tool. And it could be anything. Um, when I explain anxiety, I explain it in a spotlight form. So you'll see here, there's three images. I'll just go over it. Hopefully you can see my pencil. Um, this one is an image of when we're on edge. So when we're on edge, say for example, I've gone to school and I, I hate worksheets, hate them, don't want to pick up a pencil, want nothing to do with it. What I'll do is I'll zone all of my anxiety into that worksheet and onto that pencil. All I'll be worrying about is my hand, the pencil, the table. I won't be listening to the outside world. The teacher keeps trying to calm me going, you'll be okay, you'll be okay, you'll be okay. I'm not listening to that. I am so anxious that I am watching that pencil. On edge is taking in a little bit, but still not interested, not listening. The brain's gone into fight or flight mode thinking that that worksheet is the threat. Down in the bottom of palm, this is where we wanna be. This is where we always wanna be. We wanna be sitting in that classroom, the worksheet's been put on our table, and we just wanna be listening to everything. We wanna be listening to what our friends did on the weekend. We wanna be listening to what the teacher's saying to us. We also want to be slowing down our breathing. That's calm. But if we're anxious, all we're worried about is that pencil on that table. So whenever we see a kid who's anxious, you'll see them zone in and eye contact fully on that. You'll be saying things to them and they will not hear you. It's okay. Mummy's here. All sorts of things we try and say to calm them. Doesn't matter. When we're in fight or flight mode, that's the response you'll get. This is the key difference between a tantrum and a meltdown. When I'm in a meltdown and I'm genuinely anxious, I'm not listening to a word you're saying. If I say, do you want some chocolate? Nothing, it doesn't work. My five-year-olds, when they have a tantrum, I could say that and they go, oh, they'll respond. So that's how I always look at anxiety versus tantrums. Not always the case, but typically, it's when they can take in information from our environment, they can notice that we're there, then that means they're not on full alert this on edge, though, it's to be mindful that this on edge section can be, kids can be at that level all day. They could be ready to hit meltdown all day. And that's exhausting to be on that in that on edge mode all day. They come home and as probably some of you have already experienced, they come home and they just lose it. They can't keep it in any longer. So what we try and do is to keep down to this calm section where our Brain isn't firing all the time, worrying about all these things around us. And then by the end of the day, we won't lash out as much. It's trying to get that happy balance at home and at school. Are there any questions so far? Please feel free to ask if you have any. So what I do with the brain, um, Oh, thank you. Um, what I do with the brain is I, I, I'm obsessed with the brain. I'm obsessed with how the brain helps us learn. I love how the brain helps us to move. I love how the brain uh, um, impacts our behaviour. And there's three areas of the brain that we're going to chat to you today. I'm trying to make it as simple as possible, so please don't freak out. The first area of the brain that I want to talk to is the hippocampus. The hippocampus, as you can see in this picture, is all about memory. It looks at new and old memories. It's like a filing cabinet. So say, for example, the smell of coffee comes in and I love coffee and I know that in the morning that sets me up for my optimal anxiety level. My memory is telling me coffee's a good thing. Coffee is going to calm you, get ready for coffee. Trouble is it can also revert the other way. So I could have someone, for example, who may have a certain pitch in their voice or they may screech their pencil, their chalk on the white blackboard back in my school days and that memory is immediately stored to anxiety. The trouble with the hippocampus is our memories trigger our anxiety. 
in regards to fight or flight mode, when we're in that fight or flight mode, there's no memory of time and space. When we're in a bit, in a forest, faced with a bear, we don't care what time it is. We don't care where we are. All our brain is worried about is fighting or running away from that bear. So it doesn't store time and space. So have a think about when a, a child has an absolute meltdown, shopping centre, massive meltdown, and we try and talk to them. What happened? How did you feel? Where did that come from? And they genuinely say, I don't know. I don't know. And they, they don't know because in that meltdown, their brain didn't care about storing that memory. All it cared about was the threat. The threat could have been the sound of pram wheels on the floor. The threat could have been someone gave them too much eye contact and got in their personal space. So all their brain is worrying about at that moment in that meltdown is the threat. And that threat is real to the brain. Whether we are threatened by it, doesn't matter. That threat is real to the brain. It doesn't care what time it is and it doesn't care where it happened. So next time, it can happen again because we haven't been able to learn from it. This guy here, prefrontal cortex, I think some of you may have heard of this before. It's, there's a lot of studies being done around the prefrontal cortex in adolescence. Feel free to research more, it's amazing. So the prefrontal cortex is at the front of the brain and it's all of our logic, it's our consequence system. So when I do a behaviour, this is the consequence. But in up to adolescence, it's not a very developed area. It doesn't work very well. That's why adolescents go out and they drink and they make silly decisions because the, that section of the brain's not working properly. This section of the brain also doesn't function very well when we're anxious. This section of the brain, oxygen goes away from the centre of the brain and it goes to this little guy down here, the amygdala. This amygdala, which I'll show you in a sec, is the main zone of fight or flight. That's where the fight or flight happens. So when we see a bear and we're in a forest, all the oxygen goes straight to amygdala because that amygdala knows what to do and the oxygen comes away from the prefrontal cortex. It comes away from the hippocampus. So it's not storing memories and it's not thinking logically. It is purely reacting to whatever that threat is. That threat could be the smell of someone. That threat could be just the presence of another student in the classroom. It doesn't matter what the threat is, the amygdala will always take the oxygen and the effort from the brain. What we need to do, which I'll show you a little bit later on, is with the prefrontal cortex to get that to have ruling over the amygdala is we need to slow down. We need to pause and we need to take the oxygen away from the fight or flight area and bring it back to where we think. Going okay so far, I hope. Amygdala, here's our little friend. Please write this part down. This is an amazing resource to learn about for anxiety. The amygdala, as I said, was is where we do the danger zone. It's where we have um, fight or flight, it's really quick and it reacts so quick because it's made, if we're about to go out onto a road and a bus is coming, we want it to be quick. We don't want to think about it. So that's what it's designed to do. It's designed for survival, which is fantastic. But it doesn't know if the threat is real or if we've just thought about it. It doesn't know if the, the person is really going to danger us and put us at risk or whether we just feel worried about it. These are the troubles that kids have. As we get to adults, we can start to use internal thoughts to calm ourselves down, but children can be really quick to react when the amygdala is firing. It takes, as I said, it takes over those other two brain areas, which we need to learn from our threat and from our anxiety. So all that I love to do is understanding why a child behaves the way they do and why an adult behaves the way they do. And I love standing back and observing that. Yes, thanks, Kathy. Thank you for your comment. Yes, so thank you for reminding me. The amygdala can be larger in people with autism. It also can be larger in people who have PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. So they have done amazing studies on, on that. And you can see brain scans where it is larger. So what that means is over time, the brain learns to rewire. So if we're constantly anxious and our flight or flight mode is constantly given oxygen, we will. We'll rewire it and make it stronger. That's the amazing part of the brain. Similar to if we want to learn how to play piano, those networks be stronger and bigger than someone who doesn't play piano. That's what's happening with the amygdala. We are, in a sense, training our fight or flight system when really 
hopefully we shouldn't be training it at all. We should only need it when it's up for survival. So thank you, Kathy. That's absolutely correct. Um, the iceberg effect, you may all know this, but I always try and explain this to teaching staff and I work with a lot of integration aids as well. And I try and explain this concept of when I get given a report for what student I am to see next, I get a list of all these behaviours that they do. I get angry, frustrated, won't listen, won't talk to us, um, hits other people, throws pencils. And all this stuff that they're seeing is at the top of sea level. It's just what we see. What they're not noticing yet is what's happening under the water, under the sea level. And that's what we work on. I want to know why that kid is throwing his pencils. I want to know why that girl is crying after every recess. It's not the top level that I'm really worried about. It's what's happening underneath. And I can work on the top level and I can discipline and I can have rewards charts and punishment that attack the no hitting, no biting, those behaviours. But if I don't tackle what's happening underneath, then unfortunately I'm not doing my job effectively. So whenever we look at a behaviour, we look at what is it, obviously I want to know what it is, but where is it coming from? And the way to do that, firstly with a child, is I ask them about what their anger feels like. I want to know where it's coming from. I want to know if they can even express the anger or whether they are so reactive that they have no insight into it. So this little guy, or you can get any picture, it doesn't matter, I just get them to colour in what parts of their body feel angry and what that feels like. We talk about, I've got butterflies in my tummy, my fists go really tight, and it's just an easy concept for kids to work through. And we do need to work with them to try and understand this. I also get teachers to do it as well. I've done it. I want to know where my trigger points are and where I carry my anger and my tension. Because if it is in the hands and we start to really get clenched and we're angry, then it's giving the hands something to fidget with. If it's in the feet, then it's giving them activities like under the table to roll their feet on a can or stomp their feet when they're frustrated trying to tap into where their body feels the anger, that's where we can start to put some strategies. You've I've probably already heard this already, triggers, triggers, triggers. I'm always about triggers. Every time I hear a behaviour, I want to know what's a trigger. Why? There's got to be a reason why. Kids don't want to be the standout in the classroom looking different to their peers. Adults don't want to be the looking like they're out of control and looking like they're overwhelmed. There has to be a reason for it. So it's finding out what that trigger is. And it could be as simple as I've had a little boy just this term, last term, his was the smell of ham. But we had to go through, I'll show you this worksheet that I do, this whole list of possible things that drive them crazy, you know, like we all do. And his, he wrote ham, something so unusual, but he wrote the word ham. And if you think about it in a, in a recess or lunchtime situation, this, this little man is, smelling ham all the time. No wonder he's anxious. As soon as he smells ham, he feels sick in the tummy and he feels really frustrated. Yes, thank you, Cherie. Um, what happens when they can't explain where it is? Excellent question. We then have to start to watch for them where it is. So I always teach teachers the common signs of what it looks like when someone's anxious. Closed fists is usually the first one that I see. I also see hunched up shoulders. So you'll see they'll start to carry themselves. In the flight mode, so when they start to shut down, you'll see head down, they'll even start to get into sort of like a, a fetal position. I also look at curled up feet, so they'll start to sort of bring their feet up and they'll be in nearly tippy toe position. So at that point, if they can't express it, then we have to demonstrate it for them. And we have to, whenever they look anxious, I label it. So, hey Sally, I can see that your hands are really tight. Do you feel any butterflies or anything? Or, hey, Johnny, I can see that your shoulders are uptight. Is anything wrong? Can I help with anything? Labelling it can help them to start to feel and understand what it looks like. I also, with kids, if you're looking with little kids, I get pictures of, say, Dora the Explorer or Mickey Mouse and I snapshot happy, sad, angry of each character that they're used to. For older kids, I look at things like Ben 10. Again, happy, sad, angry. And if see if they can even express what those emotions are. We can't understand our own emotions until we know what they look like and what they are. 
Yes, <laughs> thanks, Sheree. <laughs> yeah. You'll find that when someone is anxious too, they just want to shut down. I don't want to talk to you about it. I don't actually know. If I don't know, I don't want to talk about it because I don't want to make a mistake with what I don't know. So what we can sometimes do is just model it on yourself. When mummy gets angry, mummy's hands go tight. When mummy gets angry, mummy's jaw feels really sore and see if they can give something back. But it does take a long time. Some kids can take me two to three terms at school to start to go, oh, Mrs P, my hands are really tight. It takes, it does take a while. And it's just taking that, the language that we use. What does it feel like? What does it look like? If they see a character in a book, it's always asking how they're feeling. But they look a bit sad. What do you think? Do they look sad? I also have on my website, if you need, there's a, I have a worksheet where they can draw emotions. So happy, sad, angry. And they're the main things that I work on. Please let me know though, Sharif, I didn't answer your question properly. <clears throat> um, I can also email you, you this trigger worksheet need. This trigger worksheet, um, basically it's a scale of one to five and you ask the child, how does, um, what smells bother you? How does being late to class bother you? Do unpredictable sounds bother you? And it gives them a way of saying it bothers me a lot or it doesn't bother me at all. So this worksheet is fantastic. If, or you can find heaps of resources like this that are wonderful. I just wanted to show you sort of how a behaviour therapist like myself goes through analysing behaviour. I look at the situation. So I have a young man who doesn't like the classroom door to be shut. Um, and it took us a while to realise that. He feels as soon as we shut the door, then he's enclosed and his anxiety goes up through the roof. If the door's slightly open, not a problem. But if it gets shut, that sets his anxiety off. So the situation would be him inside a classroom with the door shut, for example. We then chat to him. He's in grade three, so it's taken a while to get him to express himself. We chat about what that feels like when we shut the door. When the door is shut, he sometimes says, I get really scared. Sometimes he's been able, in a calm moment, he's been able to explain to us that I just want to get out. Um, feelings and thoughts. That's what's going on in his mind at that point. It takes ages to get that out. <laughs> um, the behaviour is what he was doing. So what he would do is he would do anything to avoid that classroom because when he avoided the classroom, he was able to open the door. So it could be yelling out in class, getting to step three where he was sent out of class. It could be throwing objects because, again, sent out of class. Um, so those behaviours wasn't anything that he, he wasn't trying to be naughty, he wasn't trying to disrupt the class, all he was trying to do was if I'm, if I misbehave, I get to open that door and my anxiety is gone. That's how, unfortunately, that's how simple it can be sometimes. Different scenario is we look at the adult reaction. I also look at a child's reaction. I had a client years and years and years ago, three children in the home, all on the spectrum, all had autism. The oldest girl who had the highest severity of autism used to love, used to pull hair of her sister. This was the behaviour. Situation was she pulled hair. Situation was there was issues in the home with how she played with her sister. We don't know how she thought, unfortunately, because she's nonverbal. We had to just guess and observe. The behaviour was she would pull hair. The reaction that she was getting was her sister would squeal, the loudest, loudest, loudest squeal. So she would pull the hair, the sister would squeal, and that was the stimulation that she was after. She loved sound, loved it. And she also loved sound that she could control. She didn't like sound like a shopping centre where it's unpredictable. She loved sound that she could control. Again, anxiety. We want to control our world to make us feel calm. So she would pull her sister's hair and her sister would squeal. What's actually the reward here is the sister squealing. And what's making this behaviour repeat every time she's anxious is the sister squealing. It's not the behaviour of the child who's pulling the hair. It's the reaction after it. So what, I, what we did in this situation is we taught the sister not to squeal and we also taught her to turn a radio up. So we, it took, again, months. It's not a quick fix. It took months. She then... Every time she went to go for her sister's hair, we would redirect her to a radio and we'd turn it up, giving her a different sensation. This is a whole other webinar, by the way, just in how senses can be involved, but it gives you an idea. Is it opening the door that is why the behaviour is occurring 
or is it someone else's reaction? And most of the time, unfortunately, it's someone else's reaction because it gives us that predictable response. When I'm anxious, all I have to do is yell. Teacher yells, I feel calm, I feel better. So trying to work out that balance of what everyone is doing. In the room. I never go in and just want to look at one person in the room. I want to see what the whole dynamic is. What's the teacher doing? What's the integration aid doing? What's mum and dad doing? And it's not of anyone's fault. We're all human. But we need to figure out that puzzle. <coughs> Sorry. This is really important, and I try and say this in all of my presentations. Be mindful of your filter. Be mindful of your lens. When I'm anxious, my little bunny rabbit spotlight gets smaller and I just zone in on a particular student person situation. I need to calm myself down to be able to see the whole environment. If I went into this young boy who used to throw tables across the room and I was just filtering in on him, I wouldn't notice that there's a little boy across the table who makes him feel anxious and scared. That's why he throws the table. He throws the table to escape from the person who's sitting across from him. What we did is we changed classes. But if I didn't alter my lens, if I only went in and I just looked at that student who was throwing the table and I didn't look at anything else, I wouldn't have been able to see the situation for what it was. So when you're feeling anxious and when your tummy's churning and your jaw's tight and you're about to hit fight or flight, try and find a way to calm. Try and always have something on you. As I said, I have a fidget toy. I also have a bangle that has that I wear to work because you can't use this all the time. I have a bangle that has tassels on it and that's what I use. So when I go into a stressful situation, into a classroom, I have that. And if my anxiety starts to bubble and bubble and bubble, then I can calm it back down. <coughs> Excellent. So thanks, Cherie. So um, it's looking at, <laughs> this, is what, this is where it gets a bit tricky, to get a reaction. It, it is negative attention, but it's also to achieve predictability. So what I always want to look at in that situation when we've got sibling challenges is, is it happening at a particular time? What is the sister doing? Does the sister look calm and the brother is feeling so anxious that he just wants someone else to feel how I feel? That can sometimes be. Is it at a time where he's hungry? Because when we're hungry, tired and thirsty, our anxiety can increase. Is it at a time when it's free play but we don't know how to play and this is how we play? So please, Cherie, write as much down as you can and we can try and nut it out online somehow um, over, over the time. Please let me know because there's so much involved in that interaction. But if you watch it, so filter your lens, watch the whole situation, not just your son, look at what is your daughter doing at that point in time, what part of the day is it, what could he be hungry? Could he be thirsty? Could he be tired? And then try. Well, you'd put in strategies at that point before we need to react to our sister to get predictability. Anxiety really is around control and predictability. Control and predictability isn't to be mischievous. It's not to be manipulative. We've just learned over time that if we have control and we have predictability, then our anxiety feels better. So for me. I control my world with routine. I'm very routine to manage my anxiety. If someone upsets my routine, they know about it. We all have our little way. It's just trying to tap into how to make that look functional. My control looks more functional because I'm not affecting anyone else. But you can give him that feeling of control in other ways that doesn't involve his sister. It takes time, but you can. Here I look at, um, I love these charts, I look at the green, yellow, orange and red. I want to know from every kid that I work with or every adult that I work with what their calm looks like, what their frustrated looks like, angry looks like, furious looks like. Because when I come in, even as a behavioural therapist, I've got 10 years experience and I still cannot do my magic, work my magic when a student is furious. Up here, I can't really do much. They're in fight or flight mode. They're not listening to me. They're not responding to me. They are at their threat, looking at their threat. But I can, in the frustrated area, start to do more, and I can do even more in the calm area. 
lot of the times we want to provide the strategy and the therapy in the furious because we get flustered and we know that's how quick we can calm them down. We want to calm them down in that mode. But it's down here that we can work their magic. It's actually practicing for being anxious before we're even anxious. So if we can always think of ways when they're their most calm or they're their least frustrated, they're the times you want to try these strategies that I'll chat to you about in a sec. On this side, it's, it's similar. So it's just trying to have a look at the emotion attached to it. What does nervous look like? It, are they biting their nails just as they're about to hit anxiety? Some kids tend to stare out into the, the distance and you'll just see them staring. Some kids will start to sort of pull at their hair, but not twisting it. They'll start to sort of give it a bit of tension. Um, some kids start to actually go wandering. They pace nearly. So it's trying to write a list of those behaviours that they're doing in a red, yellow, green fashion and then you can attach a strategy per behaviour that they're having. Excellent. We'll get into the fun stuff now. Um, this is more for older kids. So I tend to do this strategy where I reflect on behaviour around the grade three, grade four level. I also do this with all teachers. I do it with myself as well. Um, yes, Cathy, thank you. Um, zones of regulation, yes. I'll go back to that actually while you mentioned that fantastic terminology. If anyone wants to research zones of regulation, that's what this um, green, yellow and red is. Fantastic. There's also blue, but I find blue confuses some kids. So I tend to just go with the traffic light. Even orange I don't use with kids. I just use green, yellow and red. Um, so what that basically means is in our red, we're angry, we're in fight or flight mode, we're not taking much information in, we're not able to express ourselves, we're not able to understand what you're saying to us. So really, I don't even speak when someone's in red zone. In green zone, we're feeling calmer, we're taking in that environment and that's what's going to help. Um, sorry, yes, thanks Beck for answering um, Pretty's question. Um, sorry, I'm just going to read it quickly. Yes, uh, this, these strategies can help anyone. These strategies help me. <laughs> so um, these strategies help to make us reflect on how we react. So, for example, I don't really enjoy social situations. If I have a party to go to, my body is in anxious, um, butterflies in my tummy, tension in my hand. I'm starting it before I've even gone to a party. Being aware of it, my husband is now aware of it. He watches for my signs of starting to get anxious. So really all of this applies to all of us. Um, yeah, so zones of regulation, um, sorry, Kathy, to go back to you. Zones of regulation, absolutely. Please, there's heaps of resources on it. I try and teach people that we talk a lot in the green zone when we're calm. We talk a little bit in the frustrated zone and we don't talk at all in the angry zone. The reason why is because in the angry zone, as we were saying earlier in the slides, all that oxygen is going to the amygdala. Amygdala isn't our language system. The amygdala part of our brain is purely fight or flight. If you're in the forest and there's a bear, you're not going to talk to it. You're not going to wait for it to talk to you, right? So no speech in the red zone. What I might sometimes do in the red zone is I tend to do a beating pattern on their sternum if I can get that safe and that close, um, or I do a beating pattern on their arm. That takes them back to when we're infant, when we're tiny. Um, it takes them back to that um, innate um, primal phase and that can just calm someone quite quickly and I don't have to say anything. Uh, but again, only if it's safe to get that close. That tends to help me a lot. In the yellow zone, I sometimes we'll hum a nursery rhyme. Um, again, I don't want to confront them with language and questions because when I could, if someone confronted me when I was frustrated, I wouldn't want to speak to them. So I sometimes hum a nursery rhyme. Again, I try and go back to that infancy primal thing that we do, um, the sounds that we would have heard when we were in mummy's tummy. We try and go back to those um, nursery rhymes. Every kid knows a nursery rhyme and everyone really can understand that heartbeat. If they don't like to be touched, so some of my students with ASD don't want to be touched, then I just tap that rhythm on myself and they can hear the um, repeated heartbeat. Again, red zone. Green zone, let's chat to them. You know, green zone, we come back to here and we chat to chat them about what it felt like, what was going, what thoughts were racing through your head after you shut 
after you open the door, how did you feel? Before you open the door, how did you feel? All of this reflection stuff happens in the green zone, not red. Red, I wouldn't even have a conversation. Um, myself, if someone has a chat to me when I'm frustrated, nothing makes sense. It's coming out of my mouth. My prefrontal cortex isn't working properly. Um, as I was saying a little bit before, for those zones, so for those colours, we have a strategy for each. And this is individual. This won't work for everyone. We set an individual plan for each kid or each adult. So frustrated, I tend to use a star and a fist again. Most people carry tension in their hands. So I just start to do it. If they want to copy me, they can copy me. Some kids will pretend that they don't want to copy me, but you'll see them sort of make tiny ones. Um, angry, I just, I don't, again, I don't speak. I teach them this in the green zone. So when they get to red zone and I get called to the classroom, I start to clap. I start to buzz. I start to and it just triggers their memory if they're not in too high a fight or flight. Um, and then that can calm them down. If we try it, please try it. It's amazing. Getting a kid to do the buzzing gun naturally calms us down. Again, we have to get oxygen to do the buzzing sound. We have to take oxygen away from the amygdala. We have to use buzz vibration through our teeth where we carry most of our attention. So it feels beautiful, feels fantastic for some. So clapping also gives us the what we call proprioception. Again, uh, I, we can do another webinar if you want a sensory webinar or I have online training for um, sens sensory therapy. But when we clap, we get proprioception through our hands. That sensation is the same as if I hit something. So getting them to clap when they're angry is a strategy we want them to learn. Also getting them to tear paper when they're angry. Uh, but again, we teach them that green zone when they're calm. When they're sad, I tend to go for those comfort things that get them into fetal position. So we cuddle something, we might draw on our lap. Again, it gets us into fetal position. Music, music is different for each kid. Some kids love rock and roll, some kids love nursery rhymes, but music has an amazing benefit for the brain. Um, tired, I tend to, again, I don't speak too much. I don't wanna overwhelm the brain with me talking. The environment around us is enough. I don't like to overwhelm. So if I can see that they're tired, no conversation. We can chat about it tomorrow once they've had a good night's sleep. I just try and zone the environment down. I try and calm everything down. I go slower, I talk slower, or I don't talk at all. Um, scared turtle pose, I don't know how to <laughs> explain this in a webinar. I've usually done it in face to face, but turtle pose is sort of like if you get on your hands and knees and you tuck yourself down and you've got like a shell, your back is like a shell. That position takes us into fetal position. It then goes into that baby, newborn, primal phase where fetal position feels comfortable. So I try and get them to hug their knees or I get them into turtle position and I put a heavy blanket over them to calm them down. Some kids won't respond to that because they'll be vulnerable, but other kids really do love it. And humming, again, is like the buzz sound. It gives them that hum, gives them that vibration in their mouth nice and calming. There's heaps of ideas, by the way, but these are the ones that I tend to use on a daily basis. This, um, this is on my website. It's free. Again, this is an A4. I have this everywhere. I have this in every classroom that I go to. I give this to every possible teacher that I can find. Um, it's a stop and think sheet. Again, prefrontal cortex, to get oxygen to go to that level, we need to stop. We need to take oxygen away from the amygdala, stop worrying about the bear and breathe. So as soon as kids tend to colour this in, I get them to colour it in and we chat about it in green zone of this. When you see this sign, this is what we're going to do. And all it takes then is a teacher to either point to the poster on the wall or I have A5 size on a desk or hand them a card with this stop and think sign on it. You train the brain in calm zone. And then when it comes to angry zone, we know what we can do. And what we can do in angry zone is tear paper, scrunch paper, throw paper. Paper you can't hurt. Tables, we try to avoid tables. But paper's fun. I'm not telling them they can't be angry. I never tell a kid they can't be angry because I get angry. But I'm telling them how to do it, how to do it appropriately, how to do it safely. There's, uh, if we have anxiety and we're in a classroom, there will be things that set them off. How do we manage it? Well, this is a way that 
that we can manage it. In, some kids can understand this. My five-year-old twin's not here at this point yet. Um, as they get a bit older, around 10, I can start to really see how they learn how to breathe effectively. I use flowers. Um, I spend a lot of times outside with kids. If they're feeling anxious in the classroom, I tend to take them out and we go for a walk. So flowers, if we breathe in through our nose with a flower, we want to smell it. And then if we breathe out, we blow dandelions. Difficult in some seasons where there's no dandelions around. So what I do is I get a pinwheel. I don't know, I should have bought one with me to show you, but um, it's like the little fan on a stick and when we blow, it spins. Pinwheels are fantastic to teach kids how to breathe. Telling a kid how to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth isn't sometimes best explanation. They need real life ideas of how to breathe. So breathing, smelling the flower, blowing the pinwheel can get them into that, that action. When we get in red zone, we may be able to show the two pictures. I use pictures for everything. We can show the two pictures, but it has to be mastered in green zone when they're feeling calm. Some kids, I just have this beautiful schedule on their desk. It's not big. It's like the size of a business card, maybe a little bit bigger than a business card. And um, it says, I will take five breaths. So again, if I come into the classroom, I get a call from the teacher um, saying, come into the classroom. You know, we're having a meltdown. I just point to the desk. I then teach the teacher to point to the desk. We don't have to talk, we don't have to highlight in front of everyone that they're having an anxious moment. All we do, we just point and it reminds them. This is more year seven, year eight. I tend to find most success in this. This is after the children have learnt all these skills in primary school. Then they can, it's easier to, once the brain's practised it, the brain starts to learn how to do it a bit better. Um, I'll show you some more green zone things here. So I use things like worry cards. I want to know what their internal thoughts are, but as you know, as Cherie said before, it's hard for them to tell you that. So I have a worry box. It's just a tissue box, and they just fill out a worry card and they put it in the worry box. And um, sometimes it could be, you know, I've got a little man who the wind. I'm worried about the wind. It's windy outside. You know, he's always saying it's windy outside. It's windy outside. That could be a sensory challenge for him, or it could just be he's had a bad association with wind. But having wind written down, put in the worry box, we can start to work on that. But if we try to have a big, long conversation with him about it, that can be overwhelming. They can shut down. But this card isn't as threatening as me asking all these questions. Um, worry stones, they're so easy to make. My kids make them out of polymer clay. Um, I'll show you over here. I keep forgetting that I have a mouse. Um, they're just made out of clay, so they're about the size. You roll them into a tiny little ball, you put your thumb mark in them, and you just rub it. So we can take them anywhere. You can take a worry stone anywhere. Uh, class, it's not noisy, it's just clay. Um, it's dried clay, um, and they can just rub it. Some kids use blue tack as well. So if I'm trying to have a conversation, I'm trying to get them to open up. If I give them a piece of blue tack to fiddle with, I'll get so much more out of them than if I try and just have a cold conversation with them. This is my favourite. I know I keep talking about my website, but this is where all my resources are for, for people around the world. What is your car doing? Random thing. I'm sure you're looking at it going, what is that? What is your car doing? I ask kids, and particularly a lot of my clients are boys, I get them to teach me in green zone what their car does. Is their car, when they're in the library, zooming round and round and round and round and round, or is it going nice and slow? And we even get a real car and I get a big piece of paper and I get them to draw how the car's going. How's your brain going right now? Is your brain zoom, 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 zooming around or is your brain going super duper duper slow? We want them to be able to tell me that. Is my brain so crazy busy or is my brain calm? And we use that in a form of a car because the goal, no matter how old the kid is, the goal is to teach them to slow their brain down. And the way I teach them to slow their brain down is I give them a car. And I say, right, so my brain right now, I'm so frustrated. I'm zoom, 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 zooming around. And now I'm slowing down. I'm getting slower. The bumpy road is I feel so confused right now that my car is going all over the place. Oh, that's okay. We're going to get our car to go around and around and around. So um, these resources are fantastic just as a picture to ask them, how's your car going? I have some boys who are, that's my first question. It's not how are you. It's hi, how's your car going? 
I'm just being mindful of the time. It's 10 to 9. I have one more slide left. So I'll quickly run you through the figure eight because I love this. This is similar to the car, um, but what it does is when we do a figure eight, we have to use our prefrontal cortex. We have to use our motor cortex where our movement is. When we're doing this figure eight, whether it's in the air or whether it's using a pencil, we, we can't put all of our oxygen to our amygdala. Our amygdala has to turn off because it can't take over when we're trying to focus on something like this. So I get all of my students, even teachers in staff meetings, just to draw a figure eight. They can trace this figure eight worksheet or they can just draw a figure eight over and over and over again. And it's that movement, that rhythmic movement that calms the brain down, calms the worried thoughts down and starts to get us focused. Every student I give a figure eight to. And that's amazing, the reaction that they get from that. They'll then start to learn what makes them feel good. That's really my job. My job at the start is to see what's making them anxious and my job towards the end is just to make them aware of what makes them feel good. The link is they then start to realise when my body feels icky inside and my hands are really tight, this is what I do. That plan for this is what I do can stop some of the anxiety because they're no longer worried about their own anxiety. So if we finish here of having a think of you know for yourself after after we finish here but have a think for yourself of what you're going to try to do what's a, what's a what's a plan that you might try tomorrow of it might be i'm going to get my kids to do figure eight or i'm going to go to my next therapy session and i'm going to ask them if they can slow their car down um have a think of what you could do and how hopefully something from today's session has has sparked a bit of perspective but please um, ask away. Um, thank you. Yes, fantastic, Kathy. Excellent. I love all, I love what you're writing here. Um, yes. So the figure eight does use both sides of the brain. So if you imagine our body has an invisible line all the way down the middle, our brain has a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. So when we do do a figure eight and we cross over the middle of our brain, we are using both sides of our brain. When we're using both sides of our brain, it creates a calming effect. It also improves amazing skills like handwriting, reading, um, jumping, hopping. It's amazing what crossing the midline and doing a figure eight can do. So I do everything in figure eight. So I get kids to walk in a figure eight. I get kids to draw in a figure eight. The bigger the figure eight, the more calming the effect has on the brain. Doodling's the same. All I do with doodling is I encourage kids to do it big because if we do tiny doodles, then we're not, you know, expanding on the whole area of the brain. So, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kathy, for reminding me to use these terms. It's fantastic. Oh, thank you, Laura. <laughs> I know what that's like, so hopefully he goes to bed well for you. Um, not sure if everyone can hear me because I've had some real problems with my Optus. Uh, Ooh. Around that, but I thought I'd just log myself back on and uh, see how everyone is and say thank you very much um, for a fantastic um, talk and it's awesome from her. Um, for those of you who are in London, Robin will be speaking at our conference that we're having in Knox in October. I know, I'm sorry, I don't know what. Um, but this will, this is being recorded. Um, so if you can get to the Knox conference, Robin will be there with a host of other amazing, um, we've got some really fantastic speakers and Robin will be speaking on the Saturday. Robin, is that right, I think? Yes, come down, it'd be fantastic. Yeah, so if you want to go to that, go to uh, myspecialchildconferences.com and you can have a look at the agenda and what Robin will be talking about and what all the other speakers will be talking about. That'll be fantastic. I'm really pleased everyone could join us and I'm sorry that my signal is so bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, so great. If, any, if everyone's... Um, Got no more questions. Oh, Kathy. Um, no, Robin won't be at Eltham. Unfortunately, she was at the last one in Geelong, and I didn't feel like it was fair to just keep getting her in at every single one. Um, 
there are ama there are other amazing speakers at Eltham, but she will be at Knox in October. So Thanks, Kathy, all... come down to Knox. <laughs> Knox, yeah. Um, the Knox one, um, I should point out, all the speakers are incredible, really incredible. So yeah, check it out on the website and you can see all the speakers and everything. It's really good. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Kathy. No, she's not going to be there. Are you, are you going to be? I'll be there, though. <laughs> I'll be there. Um, Robin is welcome to come along as, as a guest if she wants to. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so get yourself to Knox, um, and Robin, can't thank you enough for doing this for us. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you, everyone. It's been my first webinar, so I hope it went okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Um, I'll just give it a few more minutes in case anyone's got any last-minute questions. Poor Beck's breaking up again. <laughs> um, I... If you even if you want, I've also got a. Um, if you have any oh. questions, I have an email. So it's Robin R O B Y N at the Neuro Rehab Network .com .au. Oh, fantastic, Ed. We will see you at Knox. That's excellent. Yeah. Oh, we've lost her. So yeah, sorry. As I was saying, actually, I might write my email address um, here for you. So here's my email. Feel free to ask any questions. I'm always keen to help people. Um, I'll just send that for you there. That's my email and I'll send you my website. On there I've got free um, resources for teachers, therapists, parents. Um, I also have some online um, e-books and training as well. Ah, oh, there we go. There's Beck. Beck's popping in the conferences link. Um, fantastic. So at the conference I can I have more time I can I can cover more things if there's anything in particular that you'd like me to cover at the conference please let me know um, I'm always interested to know what what people need to learn and I love hearing if you've gone away and, you, and you've tried something um, I really love hearing feedback so feedback of something that's worked feedback of something that hasn't worked uh, please share it it, it helps me um, grow as a therapist so again thank you Beck for having me if there's no other questions, I hope you all have a good night. I hope all your little ones are tucked up in bed. And, yeah, please let me know if you have any questions.